so hello everyone and uh, thank you for having me speaking and also I would also, also like to, to thank the GPAL community for developing this wonderful code since I'm more again on the on the user part. Uh, or at least sort of development uh, more on the ASE level than on the GPAL level, I would say. So uh, here's sort of a montage of the, the systems I've been investigating through my four year PhD uh, project and uh, the recurring theme throughout has been developing a genetic algorithm for structure prediction uh, with uh, first principle methods, so the GPAL. Uh, and I want to, to tell you today about uh, what we can do with this code and, uh, and how it uh, uses uh, both the LCO and the, the, the grid basis in GPAL to really uh, speed up the structure prediction process. So the original motivation for this uh, project was uh, this uh, historical uh, lesson taken from Mountain Island from up to 2007. So people have investigated gold clusters on magnesium oxide quite a lot. So here are three different studies of a magnesium oxide surface. There's an oxygen vacancy here, here, and here. And in 1990, in the first paper on the system, they proposed this as the global minimum of a gold 8 cluster on this defective magnesium oxide surface. And four years later, some of the same authors proposed this structure. And then four years later, again, my supervisor, Bakamo, proposed this structure. And as you can see down here, so this is the uh, the bond energy of these gold clusters on the surface, it uh, steadily becomes more and more stable. And of course, then when I did this work, I expected <coughs> to find a, a new point slightly more stable again. <laughs> and uh, the problem with these, uh, this approach is that this is done uh, by hand and with sort of human intuition as a, as a guideline. So we wanted to do an ultimate method that took us out of the equation. Uh, and what we chose to implement was a kinetic algorithm, which is a method for finding the global minimum, and it's based on the Dibbian evolution scheme. So we have a population of candidates who pair them together and create new structures that are hopefully then better, and at least if they are better than anything we've seen before, we replace them in the population. And we sort of keep on going until we have a, a set of very uh, nice candidates, and then we said we found the global minimum. Uh, and, it, and the nice thing about these methods are that they're based on sort of physical intuition, so we can really sort of put in our good idea of how to, to do this structure optimization. Although it does make, uh, or have this uh, side effect that we don't have any formal conversion to criteria. So we can't say with absolute certainty that we found a global minimum, but we can say that we probably have. Uh, anyway, so here I'll uh, just briefly show you how it works. So here we have the magnesium oxide surface. This is my set of star candidates. <coughs> they are all local minima, these different clusters. Uh, here we have a set of the star candidates. Then we uh, choose two of those to pair together, so we have basically a mom and a dad. And uh, I've just colored one of them blue here so we can distinguish it. So we select two parents and to pair them together. We do that by putting in a randomly oriented plane throughout that common center of mass. Then we take what's on the left side of one of them and what's on the right side of the other. And we have some rules for ensuring that we keep the same number of atoms, so everything's well and fine. And uh, this is now our our new candidate and we locally relax it and it ends up looking like this and this is of course where all the computational time is spent because doing all the rest of it here is, is easy to do and actually doing the DFT calculations are not expensive. And then at this point we have the energy, we know the energy and the Cartesian coordinates of this cluster and then we have a set of criteria we can use to figure out if we should put it into the population or if we should just discard it as a bad move. And then here I want to show an example of this. So here, this is all the structures that we've tested for this gold egg system. And you see it really tries a lot of different stuff. And it ends up there with this much. And then we can put it in energy axis. So up here is an energy axis. Each uh, vertical gray line indicates a local minimum. Here I've put in the three structures from the literature. You see that they are basically sort of all over the place. And then uh, this was in the 2012 structure. You see that uh, so this is done with PDE. I've also done this with M26L functional instead, which uh, better describes gold. And uh, because we could wonder why this is a vertical structure pointing upwards, and that's uh, then because PDE has some problems with gold and the interaction with the, the oxide. So actually, it turns out to be a flat structure if we're using a meter DGA. I don't want to go into too much detail about that here. Uh, one important thing is that. So this part down here called the next to open minimum, it's actually a, a, a two or three step process. So first we use the LCO basics and do the relaxation there, and then we have a, some criteria for figuring out if we should 
then spend data computation on time relating to the more precise method. So this is the structure any good basically compares the structure to all previously found structures to see if it's a structure we already see, and then at that point we just discard it. And it also sort of yeah, looks at the energy of it. So sometimes it's discarded it, and other times it's reacting in the grid basis. And then the actual population over in the in the genetic algorithm is only based on the precisely relaxed structures, not on the on the NCO genetic structures. Um, and that saves us a lot of time. Let's take the structure from before. So if you only use the grid basis, it needs 55 relaxation steps and it takes 570 CPU hours to relax the structure. If you instead use the SAO basis to do the first relaxation step, it has a bit more steps, but the computational cost is reduced by more than a factor of 10. That's a really a, a, a nice reduction in computational time. And then we need 17 steps going from here to there, and it takes 150 hours. So the next speed up here is a factor of 3. So <coughs> instead of investigating 100 structures, we can investigate 300 structures, which is the cost of the nice. If we then also put in a stopping criteria in between here, only around, uh, uh, we can discard about 75% of the structures because it's something we've already seen before, and we end up with a net speed of a factor of 7. So we can test 700 structures instead of 100 structures. That's a really big game. Uh, and I want to put in this slide from a uh, we have investigated gold and palladium clusters in a metal organic framework. So there's a, this metal organic framework here behind with some zinc atoms and carbon and oxygen and all sorts of different types of atoms. And here are then the correlation between the NCO energy and the finite uh, difference energy. Uh, you see that there's a really, really nice. So the red line here is just uh, has a slope of 1. And uh, over here I spaced it a bit because there's this one structure here, and this is really one of the points that shows why we need to also use the finite grid, finite difference basis, because there isn't a perfect correlation between the two, and we only really trust this one. But since there is so good a correlation between the two, we can do the local relaxations with it with the LCO basis. So I think this is a surprisingly good uh, agreement between the two methods. And now I want to change it a bit here, and because this is a developer workshop, and I wanted to. To, to give you an idea of how we uh, managed to parallelize this genetic algorithm. Because, of course, we generate a lot of structures and we need to locally relax all of them, and we would like to do that in parallel on the cluster. So instead of using 10 nodes for relaxing one structure, we can instead relax 10 different structures at the same time, one on each node. And then to do this, we need a bit of infrastructure. And on the cluster, we of course have a queuing system, and then I also have access to a database server, and in this specific case, my SQL database. I tried using SQLite, if anyone was wondering why I didn't just use that, but on a network file system that really doesn't work. So I will uh, strongly recommend that doing that if you want to use a database on the cluster. Anyway, so all over on the front end of the cluster, we then, from the information in the database, we uh, generate the population, and then we ask the queuing system if any jobs need to be started. Um, and then if that's the case, we generate some new structures, put them into the database, and then tell the queuing system that we have a new structure we want to relax. Over on the, on the job side, we can then read in the configuration for the database uh, and of course then uh, relax it. And also now and I've extended sort of this pre-screening and sort of removing structures early so that structures are for each relaxation instead. It asks the database for all, uh, all the structures that have already been relaxed and then it compares to the full relaxation path of each structure. And if it recognizes a structure that has already, basically, that's already been relaxed, it stops the relaxation early. And that happens for about 10% of the clusters generated. And it has, uh, yeah, and again, 10% there, 20% there, and so on, and then you can get more structures and get better results. And of course, in the end, the configuration marks are just relaxed, send up the base database, and the job terminates, and now the next time the front end wants to generate the configuration, make the structures, there's one extra structure. Uh, and then the, the last thing here is that, so I mentioned in the start that we can't really test the genetic algorithm. We can't really figure out if it's uh, if it has found a global minimum and with which likelihood it has found a global minimum. Uh, and also we can't really figure out if, okay, now I've come up with a new uh, mutation, I think it's a great mutation and we can do uh, way better structure optimization. Uh, but we can't really, we can since say, okay, yeah, it probably does, but we can't really measure if it if actually does so. So we wanted to, uh, to come up with a sort of formal way of testing the genetic algorithm uh, and we came to the conclusion that the only way we could do that is by running the method multiple times and then seeing 
on average, how many uh, step, or how many structures does the met method need to produce before it's found the global name? And, and to do that, we then uh, turn away from DFT and instead uh, use against the function in type binding. So it's an approximate method, but it's based on this functional theory with an extra repulsive part that is uh, fitted sort of by hand. But it has a complicated enough energy landscape that we expect performance results from DFT calculations to be transferable to performance results for DFT calculations. Uh, and the, the system we then chose to investigate is a small uh, cluster, so it's an unsupported cluster, an active uh, TI 6 or 12 cluster, which has been made reasonably good, uh, so, so called state of cluster files of the DFT method. And uh, sort of the first thing we want to test is okay, is this a non trivial problem? So we generated 10,000 random configurations. Relax them all uh, one at a time, and we uh, the best one only came within two thirds of the EV of the global minimum structure. So that means that even 10,000 structures don't even come close to the global minimum. That's, that means it's a non trivial problem, and that the JEG algorithm actually has some work to do. And then the, the thing we're doing is that we're running the JEG algorithm around 200 times, totally separate runs. So each run starts with its own random sharp population. That's everything uh, isolated from the rest of the, the populations. And we get a histogram like this. So the x axis here is the number of con configurations we need to test before we have found the global minimum. And up here is then the frequency of these in total 200 attempts. And uh, the red line here the marks the average number of configurations we need to test before we find the global minimum. And you can see there is some spread here. The green line here uh, is a Poisson distribution generated from the, from the average. So it seems like it follows more or less the Poisson distribution, which makes sense since it, this finding the global minimum is sort of a rare event. Yeah, anyway, uh, up here I've also then reported the success rate. So that means that all runs of the genetic algorithm found within three, so there's a limit, it must maximum test 3,000 configurations if you haven't found the global minimum before that, I say, okay, there's no success here. Because in practice, when running the method, we would probably have stopped a little before that. Yeah. So, uh, in this case, this is with the default parameters of the method, it has a success rate of 100% great. So, you find the global minimum in all cases, and then average number of structures of 500. Okay, so now that it's not playing games. So, the run I just showed you was this one with standard parameters and a population size of 20 candidates. So, the, it maintains a set of the 20 most stable structures, and that's what's used to generate new structures. Then we could try doubling the configuration size. That means that we need, in some sense, to test double the many configurations before we go on to the next generation. So it just takes longer. And that's what we see here, a broader distribution as the average increases a bit. But the success rate is still more or less 100%. And but the average is increased. So population size of 20 is definitely better than 40. Then we could go the other way and decrease the population size to having 10 configurations. And now we see that the average actually goes a bit down. Again, that's uh, that we need less structure to progress the generation, but the success rate uh, decreases. And that means that population size of 10 configurations simply isn't big enough to have a diverse enough uh, number of configurations to get to the global minimum. So we need some broadness in the population to actually move forward. On the other hand, if it's too broad, it just takes longer. You uh, can also then test if the mutations are a good idea to do. So we make a new configuration by penguins because <clears throat> and then we can, after we pair them together, we can uh, also mutate the structure. And uh, in the literature, there's been re many reports on mutations people claim improve the performance, but at least the mutations I've been using uh, actually decreases the performance. So up here is a run without any mutations. That's the run from before, the successful one. And we see again that errors of time seven. If we then mutate some of the structures, 30% of the structures, we increase the the average number of configurations we need. And then finally, if we mutate all structures, so we introduce a lot of noise all the time, then the, the average goes quite significantly up, and uh, the success rate also starts to go down, simply because uh, the tail of this distribution goes well beyond 3,000. And with that, I would like to conclude, and uh, so I put up these three main points, <coughs> namely that there's a really good correlation between LCO and FD basis, so we can actually use this LCO for initial organizations, they typically are highly successful in predicting structures across many different types of systems. And uh, now we actually have a method for investigating the performance of our PA. 
On that, I'd like to thank the entire group of your panelists and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank